Springs. Oh. These bouncy boys exist to propel players to even further frontiers. You're likely here because you want to make a spring for your game, either the art, the coding, or both. In this video, I'll show you how to make a spring from start to finish using Blender. Blender has tools such as the screw modifier that will make it much easier to animate it as well. If you stick around, I'll also show you how to program the spring Godot. Without further ado, let's jump right in. First, we'll start with modeling the base of the spring. With a new Blender scene, remove all the existing objects by selecting them with A and press X to delete them. Use Shift A to create a cylinder in the middle of the scene. Right click the cylinder and select Shade Smooth to smooth out the jagged edges. Press Tab to go into Edit Mode. Press Numpad 1 to go into Front Orthographic View. Orthographic View is a special type of view that projects the vertices onto a 2D plane. Basically, it'll help us visualize the cylinder more easily while we model it. Select the X-Ray tool at the top right corner and select all the vertices at the bottom of the cylinder. Move them until they're about the right height of the origin line. If you hold control, it'll allow you to snap to the grid while you move them. Now select the vertices at the top and move them down to about here. Once that's done, use the mouse wheel to go back into perspective view. With the top vertices still selected, press E to extrude and S to scale. When you choose a scale while extruding, Blender will allow you to create an indent in a model like this. Scale to about here or to your liking. Press E to extrude the vertices again and press Z to restrict the extrusion only to the Z axis. Measure to about here and then left click to confirm. From here, press Ctrl B to bevel the top of the spring so it's more rounded. Move the mouse to adjust the bevel level to your liking and click to confirm. The base is more or less complete, but we still have to tweak it as we go. Press Tab again to go back to object mode so we can apply some modifiers. With the base selected, look for the modifiers tab and select the subdivision surface modifier. The subdivision surface modifier helps make the mesh smoother, but it'll increase the number of vertices. It's commonly used in modeling despite the increased vertex density because you can keep your base model low poly while increasing the fidelity of the final product. Set the levels viewport to 2 for now. Once you do this, you'll notice that the bottom of the base rounds out and tucks in. Unless you like this look, let me show you how you can fix this. Tab into edit mode once again and select the vertices around the bottom rim. You can select it just like before or you can hold control while clicking to select the entire edge loop. Press Shift E to perform an edge crease and press 1 to maximize the crease. Click to confirm. The edge crease helps keep certain areas of your mesh roughed out while you have the subdivision surface active. This way the bottom of the base retains its original shape while the rest of the base gets rounded out. Repeat the same process to crease the ring before the extruded region, like this. Next we'll create the screw that attaches to the base. Hide the base while in object mode to make things a bit easier to see. Press Shift A to add a circle mesh. In edit mode, shrink it down a little bit. Going back to object mode, add a screw modifier to the spring. Set up the screw in iterations like I have it to make the screw longer. We will tweak the circle a bit more to get the right shape though. Back in edit mode, scale the circle to make it more oval shaped like this. Also press the G key and move it on the X axis to stretch out the spring. It may be easier to tweak it with the base in view. Once you have the spring the way you like it, add a subdivision surface modifier with one or two subdivisions. In object mode, move the base up on the Z axis right about to where the spring's top is. At this point, the modeling is done, so feel free to make tweaks as you see fit. Next, we are going to make the materials. For the sake of brevity, I won't go into much detail with the shader here. I covered it a bit in my 3D model of sprite video in the card here if you'd like more information. Or let me know if you'd like me to make a specific video on this instead. Anyway, with the base selected, go to the material tab and add a new material. Give it a meaningful name. In the shader editor, make a shader graph like this. I made two groups so I can add parameters to control the spring's color. Check the scene light and scene world right where the render options are so it's more clear that the shader works as intended. You may also need to add a sun in the scene for directional light. To control the colors a bit more, duplicate the material and change the colors on the second one. You can do this by pressing the copy on the existing material and then assigning the copy into the second slot. In edit mode, select the vertices you would like to recolor and press assign. Do this to color a spring base like this. As for the spring portion, open a new material slot and select one of the existing materials. Copy it into a new material as well and change the colors as you see fit. To make the outline, create another material slot on the base right below the other colors. This time set the surface to emission and select a black color. Check backface culling. Backface culling will allow the material to render behind everything else, creating the outline effect. Add a solidify modifier to the base. In the modifier, make the offset 1. Flip the normals as well. Set the material offset to 2, as this will select the outline material for use with the outline. It's zero index base, so the third material on our list is actually represented by 2 here. Repeat the same process on the spring, this time using 1 as the material index, since it only has one solid color. This technique we use is called the inverted hole method, which is common for adding outlines to 3D meshes. Now our spring is starting to shape up. If you like this video so far, you know what to do. Hope it's been helpful to this point.
Let's get into animating the spring. Typically 3D animations are done using rigs. However, for a spring like this, I think that's overkill. We can do all of our animation in object mode just by keyframing the location, rotation, and scale properties, as well as the properties in the screw modifier. In addition, a spring will likely not have a lot of animations associated with it, so there's no need for us to make something too involved. Anyway, let's start by making the spring's rest pose by extending the screw a little bit. In addition, set up auto keyframing by pressing this button here. Also set the number of frames of your animation to something a bit lower, like 30. It's easy enough to adjust the length of the animation once we're done. With the base selected, press the I key to bring up the keyframe menu and select location, rotation, and scale to make those keyframes. Repeat this for the screw. In addition, press the circle button next to the screw property in the screw modifier to keyframe that on frame 1. To animate the down pose, start by moving the playhead to frame 5. Adjust the screw property to a lower value so that the screw squishes. To add a bit more of a cartoonish effect to the animation, I also recommend scaling out the screw. Press the S key to scale and hold shift and press Z to scale on everything but the Z axis. You'll end up with something like this. Move the base into place as well. Now let's keyframe the up pose. We will do the opposite we did for the down pose, so increase the screw parameter a bit to make the screw extend. Also scale it in to make it a bit thinner. Move the base up again to match the height of the screw. And finally, we can simply duplicate the first set of keyframes that have a spring return to its idle pose. Select all the keyframes by clicking the first dot in the dope sheet here, and press Shift D to duplicate the frame. Move it over to frame 15. Now if you test the animation and it still feels a bit stiff, we can fix that by adjusting the timing of the keyframes a bit. If we move the last keyframe to frame 30, it will make the spring appear like it was forced up quickly and then slowly dampens into its rest pose. The animation now feels a bit more dramatic. The base still feels a bit stiff though, so let's add a little bit of rotation to give it more personality. On the down frame, I rotate the base like this to simulate the idea that it's being stepped on. One final adjustment we can make to add to the cartoony feel is to raise the base past its limits. To sell the feel even more, I raise the base on frame 14 like this so it acts like secondary motion. You can see the spring contracts, but the base still moves upwards for a little bit longer. At the top frame, I rotated the base in the opposite direction as a reaction to the impulse. Right before the spring returns to idle, I move the base down past the top of the screw slightly so it appears to fall faster. If you test the animation, it looks a lot better now. Feel free to tweak it to your heart's content, but the animation is finished for the sake of this tutorial. With that done, we can now export the spring to the game engine. Since my example is in 2D, I'll use the method I explained in this video linked here to turn it into a sprite sheet. Basically, I set up a camera and render the frames to a folder. Then I use ImageMagic, a command line image processor, to compile the frames into a single sprite sheet like this. Lastly, let me show you the logic for the spring in Godot. I have a sample scene in the description which has some basic walls and you can move the player with flicks. This gives us enough to work with to implement our spring. Create a new Area 2D scene in Godot and call it Spring. We will use an Area 2D so the player is able to move into the spring without being stopped. Create a Sprite 2D child and add the sprite sheet we just made as the texture. Set the H frame and V frames parameters based on how many frames wide and high the sprite sheet is. In my case, my sprite sheet is 6 frames wide and 6 frames high. Add a collision polygon 2D child so we can define the hitbox of the spring like this. Lastly, create a new collision layer for the spring and set the collision max to 1 so it can collide with the player. To create the spring animation, Animation, create a new animation player child node. Create a new animation called idle, which will just be a still frame for the spring when it's inactive. Add a single keyframe for the sprite's frame property, which will be the first frame of the animation. Set the length of the animation as low as you can, as it's meant to be static. To add an animation for when the spring is hit, duplicate the idle animation and adjust the length of the new animation. Duplicate the frame keyframe to the end of the animation and set the value to whatever the last frame in your spring animation would be. Test the animation with the D key and tweak the duration as you see fit. Now let's add some code. Create a script for the spring scene. Define an export variable spring power that allows you to control the strength of the spring launch on a spring by spring basis. You can instead choose to make this a constant, but it may be neat to have some springs that spring harder. It all depends on what you feel is best. Click on the area 2D node in the scene outline and in the node tab, double click on the body entered signal to add a signal to your script. Name it something like on body entered. In the script itself, add a line of code inside the new function to check to see if the body node is of the player class. Don't worry about the error. We will add the player class name to the character script once we're done here. If the condition is true, then we can set the player's Y velocity and trigger the spring animation. However, setting the player's velocity directly in the spring script is not desirable in the event that the player wants to control other aspects of itself later on. For now, we will assume it has a method called spring with two parameters, the power and the direction, and we will make this method in the player script momentarily. Add this code here to launch the player with the correct power in the direction the spring is facing, plus 90 degrees, or pi over 2 in radians. Since 0 degrees starts to the right in Godot, and our spring
spring is facing upwards, we need the 90 degree offset. This also gives us the flexibility to rotate the springs to launch the player in different directions. Now we can open the character script. Add a class name at the top of the script to resolve the error from earlier. At the bottom of the script, add a spring function like this. Add this logic to apply a new velocity to the player based on the angle supplied. We will use the trigonomic functions cosine and sine to take the x and y parts of the velocity based on the angle. If you're not familiar, these functions are used to solve for sides of a right triangle. When given the angle and the hypotenuse, which is our launch power in this case, we can use sine to get the height of the triangle angle, which corresponds to the y portion of velocity, and cosine to get the width of the triangle, which is the x portion. We will have to negate both sine and cosine so the player gets launched in the correct direction. Finally, instance as many springs as you like in your scene and test your game. That's all there is to it. You have now made both the art and the logic for a spring in your game. Hopefully you also gain some new knowledge and tools to make stuff from scratch in your own projects. Thank you for watching and have a great day.